Frank is going to uh, a wee short interview with somebody, and uh, it looks like that somebody is Damien, so that's great. Frank, Damien, and Sarah. Sarah, wonderful to see you. We weren't sure that you would be here tonight, I so this, sure. is, this is all the more... Look at all these people. Do you remember any of them? Well, we do remember most uh, of them. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's just where everybody's been so thrilled uh, at the prospect of you both being here. And thank you very much for, for oh, coming on our, our mission Sunday. You're looking powerful well. <laughs> yeah. is, is that draw the sunshine? I'd love to say it was, but we were on holidays in Spain, so this is not normal before you all come to visit next week. <laughs> well, I think the weather's supposed to be quite good this, this coming week. It must be a really peculiar thing, moving house, uh, moving location, new manse uh, and uh, uh, schools for the children. Sarah, how has it been for the last number of months? Yeah, it's been remarkably easy. I, I don't want to downplay it too much, but it has, yeah, it, it should have been more stressful than it was. Um, the Lord's been very gracious. The kids settled in really quickly to school, and it's, it's a very tiny school they're in. There's only like 95 children in it, so our four were like celebrities straight away. And we're nearly in all the classrooms, so everybody knows us. And I think that's helped the kids settle in really quickly. Um, so we've got to know people very quickly through school. The kids really, ha it's not that they haven't missed here, but they've just moved and got on with it because school has been all encompassing, so that's been great. Um, and they've settled quickly into church life too, so that's been good. And the house is great, so that makes life easy as well. So it's fantastic. Damien, um, I, I mean, it was a wonderful year that you were here. It, do, do you have a sense, looking back, of God's providence in uh, your life and in the life of Drawda congregation? Or what, what, what's your feeling on that? Yeah, um, yeah like like I, th I think I think the time the time that we had here over over the maybe year fifteen months uh, on, on reflection, I, I I think the Lord was preparing us for going back down south by coming here. Um, I I kind of our time in, in Hammond Road was wonderful, but we were I was an assistant. Well, here it just gave me a little step forward and taking a couple of decisions I wasn't able to take as an assistant, preaching every week. Um, and then also you as a congregation, I, I feel that the Lord gave me, Bloomf is a wonderful mix of people. Um, and where we are now is, is exactly the same, even more diverse in, in many ways. And, and so I feel the Lord was preparing me, but also preparing me to, for the people as well. Uh, by being here in Bloomfield, so yeah, no, and even driving up today, I was going. I enjoyed the 15 months here immensely. Yeah, I love, I love East Belfast. I enjoyed the people. I like how straight they are. I like how direct, you know. And and I enjoyed our time here in the church. You know. What What do you mean direct? <laughs> Just straight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they they call uh, a spade a shovel. Yeah. Um, Damien, uh, the the process of getting to know a congregation and a multicultural congregation is a fresh challenge. Tell us about mm -hmm. the congregation. I mean, many of us were at your installation, which was wonderful, and we got a little flavor of that, but tell us more. Yeah. So the, the, the congregation in, in uh, Drogheda uh, was in the center of Drogheda, which some, some people ended up in <laughs> on the time of the installation because Google Maps took them into Palace Street, which was the old church. And there was probably, you know, in its beginnings, uh, you know, different ministers, and then John Woodside came along, and it grew under his ministry, where they had a lovely, tight group of maybe 50, 60 people. And so when you came into Palace Street, very warm, very welcome, and everyone knew you were a visitor. And then in 2012, they built a brand new greenfield site uh, just on the outskirts of Drogheda. And that, since then, it's grown, and more people have come, a diversity. So, so now you come in, and the challenge is there's 150 to 200 people there, and they don't know if you're a regular or a visitor. Uh, and the intimacy of the 50, 60 is slightly gone. And, and so that, that evolving nature has been one of the, the challenges, I think, of coming into that. Uh, and then nationalities, we, we've Indian uh, background, we've lots of African nations, we have some Lithuanians, uh, we have, and, and they all have their own unique culture and, and way of dealing with different decision making, you know, how they express their Christianity. So our Africans are very elaborate, very clappy, would love the music to be a little bit more expressive. Um, and then we have some true Presbyterians who are very tight, very conservative <laughs> with that. You know, so it, it's, it's a lovely mix of, of folk, but, but part of the challenge of getting to know them is, is understanding their culture, understanding their story of, of their Christian story and what brought, brought them to the church. And then we're trying to do church 
with this kind of multi-nation as well. Uh, uh, you know? And doing church, Sarah, today involved a, a barbecue or lunch? Yeah, we had a, a newcomer's lunch. So anybody joined the church in the last, was it two years, 18 months, 18 months. or two years? Mm -hmm. thing. So it was quite nice. Some of them were there longer than we were. But it was nice to just actually try and get to know them because the reality is that the core group of the church don't know this group because they, they've sort of come in the last year to join the vacancy and, and we need to catch them at this point and, and get them you know, sure of what church is about and, and being part of it. And uh, yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, it was mad. But. Um, Damien, uh, Joyce has already very helpfully in her mm -hmm. opening prayer referred yeah, yeah. to a big decision that the Republic is facing in a few days time. Yeah. Do you want to say about the at the moment? Um, yeah, like if, the, 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 we, within the church we have had individuals who have since last September been uh, campaigning for the no campaign by doing the door to door, knocking on doors, handing out leaflets in, in, and, and they, they've been wonderful. There's a handful in our church. Some of us have been praying and I, I can't describe how it, it's been very different to the marriage equality bill in the sense there's been more debate and more discussion, but it, it's quite divisive. Um, so if you say no, they treat you as a, a non-progressive fascist almost. If you say yes, you're almost seen then, oh, human rights is everything, your own individual. And so there's no medium ground with this. And, and for Christians, even in our own church, you know, I, I, I would struggle with somebody who would say yes to this repealing of the eighth. Um, because from a Christian point of view, I just see God has given us, made us in the image of God. Now, we need to work extremely hard on crisis pregnancy, fostering all the services that go with it, and if we're going to say no, but there's no discussion about that at all in the, in the debate. And even, even driving down Drogheda on Friday, there was some no campaigners handing out uh, leaflets, and a lady passed them with a baby strapped to her waist, and then started having a row with the no campaigner. And I was just going, the irony of it, Here, here's a child strapped to you. Um, and it looked like she was going, I'm voting yes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's been very difficult. We've, we've a mix of doctors in who are no and yes. Um, and even in the church, we've had one or two kick back from one or two within the church going, I'll be voting yes, because ladies have been downtrodden over the years in Ireland. And, and I think partly true. I think, you know, women have been treated extremely badly, but that it's principle sometimes over the hard stories and the hard cases. Um, I think just what Joyce has prayed is just, just pray for the nation, pray, pray that the Lord's purposes and will, will keep this wonderful Eighth Amendment, which is really for the unborn and for the mother to, to safeguard them in health care. Um, and yet there's difficulties and there's hard cases to, to be put into practice with that, you know. Um, Damien, just finally, um, are there any ways that you, you think uh, we could build on our partnership uh, over the next week while? Yeah. Um, yeah, like we, we value Im immensely the, the prayer aspect of, of being partners with us in prayer. We're, we're very much, I, I feel constantly, and Sarah probably knows this more, I feel constantly out of my depth in, in, in Drogheda. Um, we have a lot of structural things that need to change, but also a lot of pastoral care. And I, and I just feel, I, I have days where I go, am I the man for this? And yet I know that the Lord has called us there. And, and it's probably a healthy thing, but just to, to pray for us during that. I have seven elders who are wonderful, very gifted, and, but very busy folk um, in the church. And, and we're just looking at the moment of pastoral care. But for partnership, yeah, de definitely keep praying for us. Keep praying for the town. It's the largest town in Ireland, 40,000 in, in, in the center of the town, and then another 30 around the hinterland. It's a, it's a massive town. Uh, and we don't want to just become happy with what we have. We want to be continually reaching out. And, and we have a wonderful footfall with our congregation. They're involved in work, uh, in healthcare and business and um, ordinary you know, jobs in every, every situation. But yeah, prayer, prayer particularly, we, we would love you to keep praying for us. I know you pray on Wednesday nights and, and throughout the week and stuff, but yeah. Bless um, you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. And we look forward to you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Great. Alan McBride's going to bring us a reading from a cha Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, just before Damien comes and explains that to us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you who were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, 
All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, it's lovely to be with you tonight, and thanks for the, the warm welcome uh, this evening. Um, I picked um, Ephesians 2 main, mainly because I heard it was a mission Sunday for you, focus when you focus on mission. Um, and I picked Ephesians 2 because it's so well known, and uh, I want to disappoint you straight off. You're not going to hear something new, uh, but you will hear about the gospel, I hope. And I hope it encourages your own heart, but also as you head out into this week, that it maybe helps you share this gospel uh, with others as well. So join with me in turning uh, to Ephesians chapter 2, and you'll find it on page 1173 of the Pew Bibles. So page 1173 uh, of those Bibles. And as you're doing that, let me pray for us as we come uh, to God's Word. Father God, we thank you for being together tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the praises that we've sung to you reminding us of your grace and your mercy. And Father, tonight as we come to a very familiar passage in Ephesians 2, we pray, Father, for your living word to warm our hearts again of what you have done in bringing us into Christ. And we pray, Lord, that it will help us as we share this wonderful gospel with others tomorrow morning or throughout this week or in the months ahead. Father, be with us as we open your word and help us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> You've probably uh, seen pictures of this. You may even have watched uh, TV programs of various sorts or even seen it on social media platforms. And we normally find uh, fascinating, we really love it, really, to be honest, the whole idea of before and after stories. And uh, it could be different ones. I have a few pictures up here. It could be the before and after story of a haircut. Before you looked like a, a ragamuffin, and now you're all tidied up, or you spent a good bit of money getting it all dolled out. Or maybe now we're, what are we, five months into the new year, and you look back to January and you see the before story of four stone lost. I'm ready for the, st I'm ready for the shorts or the bikini for the summer. It's a before and after story. Others of us love the before and after story, particularly at this time of year, with regards to the garden. The before story is like a zoo or a jungle. Now it's all tidy and prim and proper, or even a house cleanup. Maybe you've moved house or something. But overall, we generally love, don't we, the story of before and afters, those kind of stories that captivate us. And as we come to Ephesians 2 this morning, or th this evening, uh, verses 1 to 10, we're going to encounter particularly a before and after story, as Paul reminds the people of Ephesus of what they once were before the gospel and now what they are. And so let's start with verses 1 to 3 for a moment. There are three things described in these opening verses. The first is this, is a condition. The second is a way of life. And the second is a standing in verses 1 to 3. Let's look first at the condition in verse 1. And here's how Paul describes it. He says to these Ephesian Christians, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. These people were dead, it says. He's very frank, isn't he? How is that possible? They go to work every day. They bring up their families. They were involved in daily life. And yet the Bible has the audacity to say that you were dead dead. But what it's speaking of here is spiritually dead, physically alive, but spiritually dead. And they're dead in certain things. They're dead in their sins and transgressions. I suppose today when a lot of people think about sin, they see it as a bit of an old-fashioned idea, don't they? Um, others may associate sin with being guilt-tripping people. 
or others just see it as something not too serious, something that's not to be taken too seriously. But when the Bible uses a word like sin and transgressions, it has specific meanings to it. Sin, firstly, is basically the idea of going off on the right way of life or way of path. It's a deviation from what is right and true. And the Bible tells us clearly, remember that famous verse from Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all gone off the path, as it were. We've deviated from God's word, from his commandments and ways. All have. Transgressions, then, is a a similar but slightly different one. In the sense, it captures the idea of missing the mark. And if you've ever played darts, and I know some people have, imagine for a moment with me in order to understand this word of transgressions. Imagine you pick up a dart, if you've ever done it. You remember the stance where you put one leg in front of the other slightly and you hold it out and your hope is what? It's to get 180, right, isn't it? That's the mark, that's where you go for. And as you take your stand, you're dead on it, you're ready to go and then when you hit it, unless you're the power tailor, you generally miss it, don't you? And you end up with a one or a five either side of it and you're just got it. And that's the idea here. We aim for it, but then there's a transgression. We miss the mark. We go left of it. And yet, the Bible tells us that we have missed the mark in loving God with all our hearts, in loving our neighbors as ourselves. The Bible tells us we've missed the mark, but we've also deviated away from it. And when we sin and transgress, something happens. The Bible tells us that we die, that we're dead spiritually. And if you look at the Garden of Eden, that's what happened to Adam and Eve. They died spiritually when they forgave, when they rebelled against God, even though they were physically alive. And there's not one of us in this room tonight, and this is the reality, who have not sinned and fallen short of God's glory and marks, as it were, his word. We're spiritually dead. We may be alive physically, but spiritually we're dead in our sins and transgressions. We do not seek God. We do not desire to know him. We've missed him and we're spiritually dead in our sins. And this takes us to the second part of of verses two and three. Do you see it there in front of you? Where it describes not just a condition, but it describes a lifestyle. Do you see it? It says there, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one stage, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. There's a particular lifestyle or way of life described here in verses 2 and 3, following the ways of the world, the culture of the day, the way things were done. And for those who lived in Ephesians, there was a particular lifestyle, a particular way of doing life in Ephesus. Go back to Acts 19, maybe during the week, and you'll describe that the witchcraft and sorcery that was practiced in Ephesus was quite high. Artemides was the great god of the time, and she was worshipped in all sorts of ways. And we see in verse 3 that whatever they desired, craved, thought about, they followed after it without restraint or without question. This was their particular lifestyle, their particular way of life, living according to the ways of the world and the sinful nature. And in the Bible, when it speaks of the sinful nature, it speaks about our humanity in its natural self that is hostile to God, resistant to God and his ways. And this was the once the way they lived. A certain way of life And also, do you notice, a particular follower as well. Beginning of verse 2, and it tells us about the devil, about Satan. He's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air, and he's at work in those who are disobedient to God. It's a sad story, isn't it? Quite depressing in many ways. In our natural self, we are no different from the before story here of the Ephesians. We are dead in our sins. We are following a way of the world and its patterns and its ruler. What we do, we want to do. What we desire, we follow after it. Whatever we want, we will crave and follow it. It feels good, we'll do it. And the pervading mood is one of hostility to God and his ways, all because Satan's at work in those who are disobedient. It's a bleak picture, isn't it, of our condition before God naturally. But it gets worse, do you see, in the end of verse 3, because it also tells us how we stand. Like the rest, he says, we were by nature objects of wrath. In other words, what this verse is saying is that we are under the hammer, as it were. We're under the wrath of God and the anger of God because we've sinned against him, transgressed his laws, missed the mark, 
And John Stott explains God's anger and wrath in this way, which is very helpful. It's not like you and I. It says this, it is God's personal, righteous, constant hostility to evil, his settled refusal to compromise with it, and his resolve instead to condemn it. God's wrath is not like a a temper tantrum or a flare-up of his anger. His wrath is settled. It is constant. It's not inconsistent. It's actually consistent, and it seeks to condemn sin wherever it is. And that means for you and I and for those that you will rub shoulders with tomorrow, we can't just say this like they would down in Ireland, down the south. They would say, Asher, it's all right. It's okay. It's not okay for God because it's settled. It's constant. You can't say that this is not serious. It's an affront to God and his character, and he will deal with it, and we are sinners under the wrath of God. This is the condition. This is the way of life. This is the under us, under condemnation. Verse 1 to 3 is the before story. It describes those from Ephesians, but it is also our story if we, in all reality, embrace the truth of God's word. This is how God puts it. We're spiritually dead, doing what we want when we want, following our own ways and the culture and the leader of the world, under the devil's control and influence, under God's judgment and condemnation. And the question is this, what can we do about it? What can we do about our condition, our way of life, our standing with God? Is there possibility of change? The answer is we can do nothing. It is impossible for us to change our condition our way of life, or our standing before God, as verse 1 to 3 spell out. How can something that is dead move itself to change or to make a difference? And this moves us to verses 1 to 4, to the good news, as it were, the after story, the best news of all, the most wonderful news of all, the really good news for you and for those that you will rub shoulders with tomorrow, as we see from if verses 1 to 3 are true, And we believe it is because it is God telling us the reality of our condition. We have no hope of changing ourselves. There is a need for God to come and act on our behalf. And so what you see in verse 4, though it's not picked up in in the NIV translation, verse 4 in the Greek starts with these two words, but God. So he spells out the bad news, our condition, our way of life, our condemnation. And then it begins in verse 4 but God, but God acts for us. He does something. Verse five tells us God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. You see, only God can take that which is spiritually dead and make it alive. He has the ability and the power to make us spiritually alive. And that is what he, what he did for these Ephesians. He convicted them of their sins and their need for the gospel he, God drew them to himself and made them alive so that they could respond in faith and repentance. God made them alive. And the question is, I suppose, for each of us, even though we presume we all come to church, is, is that true for you and I, that we are made spiritual life? Is that your story? Is that God's story in your life? But God, God stepped in, God acted. He made me spiritually alive so that I could respond to him and have a before and after story. But you've got to ask the question, why would God do it? Why would he do this for us? He certainly doesn't have to, does he? If you've been wronged, the hardest thing is to act for that person that has wronged you, isn't it? Or if our sin affronts God, why does he do it? Why doesn't he just squash us, condemn us? And verses 4 and 5 spell out something of the reason why God acts and does what he does. Do you see it? It says there, but God, who, who's great love for us, He created humanity to know him, and our rebellion separated us from him, but God's love continues, and he acts out of that love. It also tells us, doesn't it, from those verses, verses 4 and 5, that he is rich in mercy. All we deserve is his judgment, and that mercy is only possible because God's justice was satisfied at the cross for us. His grace, do you see that? His favor, his goodness, which is undeserved, unmerited by us, is given to us. So we have the love of God. We have the mercy of God, and then we have the grace of God, which moves God to make us spiritually alive. Surely the psalmist is right when he writes this. The Lord is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger, 
and abounding in love. Folks, this evening, this is wonderful news for us. Maybe we've become so familiar with it that on a daily basis we're just, yeah, yeah, I know this. I know I was dead and God made me alive. But the reality is he is still doing this great work. Um, there are a couple of stories in Drogheda where we've, even in recent days, we have one lady who's been coming since September, not because I turned up, but becoming because God drew her into the church. And since she's come, you can tell that God has made her alive. She's come along to the Christianity Explored. I've never seen somebody so eager to learn. And then we have other folk who I just don't know where they are, where they seem dead, but maybe they're not. Maybe God is at work and making them alive in Christ. And we're just working out what God's story has been in the before and after with folk here. And here is what God does. He is in the business of taking those who are spiritually dead and making them alive. And so as you go to work tomorrow, this is what God is at. He is at the process of taking that which is dead and making it alive in him. It's a miracle when that happens. It's a work of God's grace and love and mercy that he does that for each and every one of us. And this takes us to verses six to seven, because God not only makes us alive, he changes our standing before him. See verse six where it says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We've been raised with Christ, the one who was raised from the dead. We are now seated with him at his right hand because Christ was seated at him. The easiest way to explain this, is, and I'm sure you know this, is, is that this is union with Christ, that all that has happened to Christ, we have been brought into the blessings and the goodness of Christ. It's called union with him. And now here in chapter 2, God tells us you've been raised with Christ. You sit with him. It's as if God sees you with Christ, seated with him in the heavenly realms, that union with him, all because he has made us alive. These are the benefits, as it were, of what Christ has achieved at the cross of Calvary. In Christ, we've been made alive. But now we have been raised and seated. Who do you think you are? This is what God thinks of who the people of God are. You've been raised with him, made alive, seated with him. And then verse 7, which is a lovely verse, reminds us again that as we hear this, God does all this so that in the coming age, it will show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I see this verse, and I'm a bit indulgent. I don't know if I have a verse to back this up. I see this verse that when Christ gathers his people together, There'll be people there and you're going, he's here, <laughs> she's here. And we'll just go, all because of the incomparable riches of his grace, the kindness that's shown to us. And I think when we get there, we'll go, you know what? I'm fortunate all because of Christ that I'm here. <laughs> it won't be a case of thinking that God got a good, good deal here, I'm in the door. But rather we will see in all its beauty and magnitude what Christ has achieved through his grace, and we will see it expressed his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And this takes us to the last two verses this, this evening, verses 8 to 10, where it is God's grace and gift. Generally, when you hear before and after stories, whether it's the losing weight in January and then come back in May and you look like a sculptured uh, gymnast or something, what is it all about, these before and after stories? It's about effort sometimes, isn't it? It's about all the hard graft and the work of before and now after. And you put a lot of work into cleaning up or cleaning up your life or doing something somewhere. But when it comes to the before and after story of the Christian, our effort and our work and our determination doesn't really come into it. And in these last two verses, we see that Paul reminds these believers that they are saved by God's grace true faith, and it is a gift from God. We are rescued by God's actions, his move and plans. Even the faith to respond and trust are a gift from God. Isn't that hard to understand? Because sometimes down south, that when we're talking to people about the Lord Jesus and, you've, and you're sharing your faith, many people will say to you, you've such great faith. And yet this verse is telling us that even the faith, the initial faith to respond to God is a gift from him. That a dead individual cannot respond in faith unless God makes them alive. And here this verse is saying that it is the gift of God, even the gift to respond 
by faith is a gift from him. And again, because God makes us alive and it aids us in the response of faith. What difference does all this make? This work of taking what is dead and making a life centers on God alone. It doesn't center on us. Who he is, what God enables and has done through Christ is where it centers. It should lead to praise. It should help us to see that even the faith we have to respond is a gift from him. It should help us to marvel at the grace and kindness of Christ in in him. And lastly, we see this work of God should aid us in how we see good works in verse 10. Do you see it? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Having been saved by grace through faith, we are given works to do, not to make us right with God, but rather these works are to be done out of a gratitude for all that Christ has done for us. And you see, it's out of a thankful heart What are the works that God has prepared for you and I to do? I wonder what they will be tomorrow. For some of you, it'll be work. And you go, oh no, it's Sunday night. I'm back at work tomorrow. I'm back to the grind. Is that work that God has prepared in advance for you to do? Probably is in his sovereignty and his grace and mercy, even though it might be killing you. What about that schoolwork, that university? Some of you are coming towards exams. God has prepared works for you to do. It could be that studying. It could be doing the same old stuff day in, day out. It could be the family. It could be changing that nappy for the hundredth time over these next couple of months. It could be the wife and husband relationship. God has prepared for us to serve in his local church, his family. And the question is, what is the works that God has prepared for you to do? For Sarah and I at this moment in time, it's been in Drada. It's building friendships. It's building relationships with the church folk. It's trying to teach and be ministering to the church that is there, but also reaching out. And you know what? We need God's grace and mercy to do that. He has works for us to do, works that will bring blessing and honor to him and in that. Folks, on your mission Sunday, this gospel is an amazing gospel because it tells us that we are dead. It tells us we're in trouble, that we're under the wrath of God. And it doesn't tell you, fix it yourself. It doesn't say, pull up your britches get work in here, sort it out. What it says is look to God. He can make you spiritually alive. And then he blesses you with his kindness and grace. And then he says, I've works for you to do. I have stuff for you to do. Go and do it and honor me in it. And may the Lord help you throughout this week to do that as you acknowledge his grace and mercy in making you alive. Let me pray for us as we continue this evening. Father, we thank you for your word to us tonight, and we thank you, Father, particularly that in making us alive in Christ, your son had to die, that he took upon himself our sin and our rebellion, our transgressions, and he died for them so that he could be raised and satisfy your justice and then raised to life and now seated with you. And Father, we thank you for the miracle that is the union with Christ that we can enjoy, that we too have our sins forgiven, that we're made spiritually alive, that we are now raised with Christ and seated with him, all because of your grace and your mercy and your kindness towards us. Father, we thank you that you've given us good works, which you've prepared in advance for us to do. Lord, help us to embrace those good works. As your, as your providence and your goodness to us. Help us at work tomorrow. Help us in our university. Help us to serve locally here in the church and in this community for your glory and honor. And Lord, we thank you that one day, that when you gather all your people together, they will marvel at your grace and your kindness to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we long for many more to experience God's love and mercy and grace. And we pray for... Bloomfield here as a church, Father, that you'll use them in this area to share the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in this area, and that it will ripple out, we pray. Lord, you're a good God, and we praise you today for making us alive in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It is by grace you have been saved through faith.
This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that nobody can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide this night.